Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm really, really proud to introduce our next presenter. Don Ware is on our board of directors. Um, he's been very valuable, very valuable to our organization over the years for bringing in his clear-headed thinking, um, his big heart, and his ability to help us sort through uh, the myriad of qualified speakers that we have to choose from every year to help us reach a balance, okay? Um, look, Don's a little bit controversial, okay? But he c concentrates on the big picture and no matter what, okay, I'm telling you guys, Don approaches everything with a big heart and agree or disagree, um, he's coming from the right place, okay? He, he wants nothing but good, and he's really a wonderful man, and he has given invaluable service. He, he's been to every single Congress convention. We invited him to become a director right after the first one. He's literally our senior director, along with Wendell and myself. He's been here the longest, and he's also been to three out of the four summer events. So um, Don doesn't speak all the time, but when he does, it's really worth listening to, okay? I think you're gonna really, really enjoy this presentation. This is new stuff. Um, Don has not talked about this before, and it's real solid, good, interesting stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Ware. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Good morning. This is, as Bob said, I think the 19th year in a row that I've been at this Congress. And I want you to know that I can feel the love that so many of you share when you come to the International UFO Congress Convention. I also have a serious love affair with Mother Earth. And I'm talking about sharing Earth with various intelligent species today. So what do we call them? So just press this button and you'll see the next slide. And it's not working. Is there something else here I'm supposed to press besides the uh, I might need a little help here getting to the next slide up. This little device is not doing it for me. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll press that one. There you go. Forget this thing. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Cetaceans are the dolphins and whales. And uh, is there any way you can get the lights brighter up here on the podium? I don't see a light on the podium. About these, these verticals overhead, that would really help. Maybe my glasses will help too. <laughs> uh, these species or groups of species. Uh, Include the cetaceans, a Bigfoot, which we call Sasquatch or Alma, from the uh, mountains of Siberia, forests of Siberia, uh, snowmen of Nepal and China, and I think they call them Wookiees in Australia. These are eternal spiritual beings in physical bodies that were designed to be non-technological. And there are four other species that share this planet with us that have technologies capable of allowing them to come and go from the planet fairly easily because they have anti-gravity technologies. Homo sapiens sapiens is one of those species, and you've heard a lot about that at this Congress. Some of you uh, may not know, 
unless you saw the movie last night, that in 1929, an alien species called Aldebarans came here and helped the smartest scientists develop anti-gravity technology. Now, those scientists in 1929 were German. And the Aldebarans, I think, were chosen for this project because they look enough like us where they can interact face to face without grossing us out too much. So, I think the reason, one reason, that they did that was so that we wouldn't have to burn fossil fuels in our aircraft when we started carrying people around the skies in airplanes, which we were doing in 1929. But there was a rule, and the rule says you cannot use this technology that we helped you develop for warlike purposes. In 1938, when Hitler was getting belligerent with his neighbors, he broke the rule by putting an anti-tank gun turret on the bottom of a 100-foot diameter flying saucer. You know that the tank was the most fearsome weapon of war at that time, and that would just give Germans an unfair advantage that uh, was against the rules of engagement. As a result, more advanced aliens, Pleiadians, picked up the vehicles he had militarized, the scientists that built them and their families and took them all to an alien base in the jungles of South America and gave them a choice, said, look, you can raise your kids on the Pleiades or you can raise them here. If you stay here, you have to stay separate from the warring nations. Some of those children, I understand, were taken to the Pleiades 500 light years away, raised their kids. Some of those kids have now chosen to come back here and are working on black budget programs for BMW and perhaps some others. Those that stayed here were taken to the underground facility in the Antarctic, which uh, we heard a lot about yesterday or last night, and continued. Uh, we brought 30 flying saucers back to this country from Germany in 1945, went to White Sands Missile Range in Area 51, and some of the saucer reports you hear uh, were us flying these, some automatic, that is, without pilots, and uh, some later. Some of them, a lot of them crashed. <clears throat> Homo alterios spatialis, our hybrid offspring with zeta reticulin genes, who are so different from our neighbors that they would not accept them. How many of you saw the movie Powder? Not very many of you. I highly recommend that. You can get it in the, in the bookstores or in the video stores. Uh, powder was, he was fairly large-headed, bald, very light-skinned, twice as intelligent as the rest of us, probably, and very, very sensitive. And the movie shows the difficulties with somebody with his characteristics having, living amongst and interacting with some who are still somewhat barbaric in nature and even have troubles living next door to somebody with a different color skin. So. Uh, I think there's a message in that movie that would be good for us. The first man to get a PhD in civil law relating to space uh, said that they are a new species that we made. I'll get to that later. The Dagon people. Uh, are survivors from Atlantis, and they chose to stay on this planet after their more selfish friends chose to leave the planet. I'll tell you a little more about those later, and I want to thank Sandra Bearwolf for handing me a copy of the Sea Gods After Atlantis when I left this Congress a couple of years ago. 
it was the most interesting reading material I had that year by far. Reptiloids of the Inner Earth. That's what Lacerta called her species. Some might say reptilians. But these are the earliest long-term intelligent residents of our planet. And they were here before humans, and they're still here. Genetically engineered by aliens from the leftovers of, of the dinosaurs after they had some serious earth changes back millions of years ago. To set the scene, here are some statements that um, describe my reality and hopefully help remove some artificial limits that we place on our thinking. The universe will always be far more complex than uh, <clears throat> the human mind can comprehend. Now, most scientists will agree with that statement. And if you get into a specific discussion with them, you might have occasion to remind them of that if they disagree with, you know, take exception to some specific of your new reality as you build it. This world is a far different place than what most people are aware of. I want to describe my reality before we get into more information on these six species. I hope all of you truth seekers who are here have a large mental whole basket. I chose that term because when I was in the Air Force and you, I ended up after I was flying fighters for a primary duty, I had three baskets on this corner of my desk. The end basket on the bottom is where the secretary puts stuff you're supposed to process. The top basket is the out basket, where you put it there after you finish doing whatever you need to do to it. But that whole basket in the middle is where you put the stuff that you just haven't quite figured out what to do with it yet. And if you have a large mental whole basket as you seek truth, I think your learning curve will be steeper. And that maybe is why I've gotten to the point I've got, besides the fact I've been fully retired for 27 years, had more time than most other researchers to read and go to six conferences each year for the last 20, 26 years. In 1982, is, that's when I retired, and, and the first day of my official retirement, I became a field investigator and state section director for MUFON. As I expanded my study into the, all of the persistent mysteries of mankind, I think that uh, that mental whole basket really helped. So if you want to be on the fast track, keep that in mind. Angels and aliens are eternal spiritual beings. Now, I define aliens as eternal spiritual beings that are in physical bodies that don't look like us and angels as uh, it's what many people call unseen messengers or light beings or seraphim. You're into some biblical terms. God is all that is, or universal consciousness. If you want to discuss the really big issues with others that you don't know well, I think it's really good to start off with sharing what your view of God is. You don't have to agree with the other person's view of God, but you'll have a better discussion if you're aware of how they view God. We are all divine beings. I believe there is a piece of the universal Father in you and me and everybody else. 
The Urantia book tells us that it's a part of our mind, our mental body, that is part of our soul. We are all divine beings. There's a piece of that universal father in each of us. I am an eternal spiritual being, and it's a really good thing because the path to paradise is a very long path. Knowing this makes it easier to overcome fear and anger, something I was able to do 21 years ago. Intelligent life is abundant out there. I recall uh, reading about George Hunt Williamson's Truth Seeker group channeling the solar cross of, in the 1950s in Victorville, California. He described intelligent life on the other planets in our solar system, some form on all the planets. Most of a higher vibratory rate, usually not seeable by the human eye. A waspy, a new Bible, has uh, been one of the six classics acquired from higher intelligence in the English language that I've found very useful. It's a history of the planet for the past 25,000 years projected one year into the future. But it gave me an idea of what circumstances on this planet allowed higher intelligence to violate the prime directive or make exception to the prime directive. And it's when our national leaders are leading humans astray. They're able to take actions. If you heard Wendell Stevens talk yesterday on tape, you see how they took action with Gorbachev and with his wife to help move things in the right direction. Wendell uh, told me that these tapes from the Solar Cross were so well done that they were broadcast in a weekly series in California. And these broadcasts had very high ratings. Not many of us know that. That was quite a while back. The Urantia book uh, describes, actually it was, I think, a waspy that describes billions literally billions of angels and aliens here to assist us through this highly traumatic transformation process we're going through right now. That's good. The Rancher book says there are, I think, 10 million planets in our local universe that have intelligent life, and 7 trillion in the grand universe. That's a number that's hard to comprehend. Alien vehicles crash. In Ryan Wood's recent book, Top Secret Eyes Only, describes 74 crashes of unknown vehicles since 19, 1897. And he missed two that came down in Gulf Breeze in 1988. One of those incidents is described in Leah Haley's book, uh, Lost Was the Key, talking about the keys to her mind, the compartments of her mind that were shut off, sometimes by aliens and sometimes by some government personnel. There was a lot going on in Gulf Breeze back in 1988. Uh, Ed Walters took, he had, in five and a half months, he had eight 22 encounters, including 18 separate photographic sessions. Took pictures of every, of three different kinds of UFOs with every kind of camera we gave him or he used in stereo cameras and the self-referencing stereo camera rig that he was taught to build by, by uh, Bruce McAbee, our photo analyst on that case. 
Bob Exler was assisting in the case. He was writing letters to congressmen, and he wrote a letter to the president saying that, hey, there are aliens down here in Gulf Breeze they are violating U.S. airspace and they're violating human rights by picking up people without their knowledge or consent. And he was getting responses from the congressmen saying that, you know, some of them were saying, well, they'll look into it. And he got one by a, an admiral that had, that had uh, air warfare in his title block. And the admiral said he was writing for the president. And they were looking into it. The, um, <clears throat> the incident, the Gulf Breeze incident that Leah Haley writes about, we know happened sometime between the 5th and 11th of August, 1988. Because uh, those are the nights that she was in the hotel in Mississippi, she was picked up from by the aliens. Now our government got her back in that room and caused her and her husband, who was sleeping there, to wake up the next morning with no memory of anything that happened that night. I think the reason we took that vehicle down with a directed electromagnetic pulse device 10 miles south of my house there in Eglin Air Force Base is because the television crews of Unsolved Mysteries, Current Affair, and Hard Copy, those are two of the biggest tabloid TV shows they had going on, were all in Gulf Breeze trying to get the same kind of pictures that Ed Walters had been getting of those three different kinds of alien vehicles. And if they had been successful, I think it would have been too tough for the powers to be to keep the general public from getting too excited. So I think there was a reason for us taking that vehicle down with the leading weapon in our non-lethal weapons program. Project Serpo is real. It happened. How many of you have been to serpo.org? Not very many. You all need to do that. For the past uh, four years, six defense intelligence agency folks, some I understand still in active duty, have been leaking into the public domain some really important information. Seek it and you will find it. But uh, we did send 12 of our Air Force officers to a Zeta Reticulan planet called Serpo in 1965. Eight of them came back in 1978, knowing that they would be restricted living on Air Force bases for the rest of their life, not able to talk about it with anybody except their, their compadres that came back with them. And the last one died in 2002. And according to the rules of engagement by our intelligence folks, only after that were they allowed to talk about it, so they start leaking it into the public domain. They went through their, the same, or their high altitude pressure training in the same pressure chamber I went through at Tyndall Air Force Base. Some of the instructors there, you know, have been talking about what's going on. There were 16 of them trained, only 12 of them went. I personally think that it was all men. They decided that taking taking those two women that were trained for planning to go 10 years with no other humans around would be too much trouble, more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> if you go to serpo.org and, and click any link, you'll get 30-some little buttons up top. If you haven't got time to read all that stuff from the, of what happened on planet Serpo, at least read 27A, which is Bill Casey's all-day briefing to President Reagan in March of 1981. I mean, if that's the straight information, which I'm sure it is, it's a transcript. It has every, ah, you've got to be kidding me, that Reagan said when he was being told about Project Serpo and many other aspects of the alien presence. 
just one more example of the, the statement I often make. There's more information about the alien presence in the public domain than any of us could possibly as assimilate in the rest of our lifetime. So don't get angry about somebody not giving you, the president not telling you what's going on. They're doing it. They're just doing it in a way that maybe you don't expect. Disclosure has been happening for a lot of years now, and it's just progressing in rate. Project Solar Warden is real. Human-operated, uh, Earth-based fleet where they're supplying and, and, you know, taking people back and forth to our bases on the Moon and Mars and probably elsewhere. Uh, I know uh, George Robinson, when he spoke here under the titles Space Law and Astro Law, mentioned the planet Serpo, or the moon, or excuse me, the moon Europa, which uh, I think is the moon of Jupiter. I think Alternative 3 has some truth to it, probably some disinformation too. But I think with that advanced technology the Aldebarans helped us build, we put our first manned base on Mars in 1963. We had manned bases on the moon before that. Living underground, Earth is becoming a fourth grade classroom for the soul. And uh, the terminology of third density consciousness and fourth density consciousness, consciousness I think is best described in the raw material. 104 Q&A sessions between Don Elkins and the same guy who influenced Egyptian civilization throughout thousands of years ago agreed to answer all the questions about the reality of the universe or human history as long as it didn't affect living persons. If you haven't read the raw material, I think that's the, the telepathic acquired information that's best assimilated by the scientific mind. 28 January 1992, I had a clairvoyant experience. I woke exactly 2 o'clock in the morning, said 2.00. I was wide awake from a, from a deep sleep. There was a video screen in my mind that had two sentences written on it, two lines each, one above the other. There was no room in my mind until I got up and wrote down those two sentences. The first one said, unconditional love is becoming the driving force on this planet. And the second one said, I am trying to learn to express unconditional love. As soon as I wrote them down, my mind cleared to think about other things, going back to sleep. Obviously a paranormal experience. For those who, are, who may be first-timers here or something, uh, third density consciousness is described by Ra as where your eternal spiritual being is in your physical body for the purpose of using free will to make choices that polarize your soul towards service to others or service to self. And once you make enough choices, you're ready to graduate to the next level of consciousness where your reason for being is to learn to express unconditional love of others, at least on this planet of others. There are planets where a highly selfish might incarnate for a different reason. But I recognize lots of angels and aliens assisting the leaders on this planet transform this planet to a fourth grade classroom for the soul. And I think there are probably a billion people who are already part of that fourth grade experience, whether they know it or not. They are the meek destined to inherit the planet. We're going to see big changes as soon as that growing minority becomes a majority. The one we call Jesus, I think, will come to our graduation as a fourth density positive planet. And I've seen lots of evidence that our world leaders know this and are planning for it. 
You can read a little bit about this on uh, lucistrust.org. Formed in 1922, the year after the Council on Foreign Relations was formed, along with the Royal Institute for International Affairs and the Institute for Pacific Relations. Some of the earliest formal branches of our, what I call our world government. I actually mentioned to Scott Jones one time, I referred to it as the secret world government. And his response was, perhaps it's best to refer to it as the not-so-secret world government. Let's see. Dolphins and whales are different. I had a, a, a really good friend up in Raleigh, North Carolina that was absolutely convinced he spent his last lifetime in the, in, as a whale, in the body of a whale. I know some now that uh, claim they, they were dolphins in the last lifetime. Scott Jones was funded by Lawrence Rockefeller for, for a number of things. One, first, when he was, uh, when Scott was working with Senator Pell for the purpose of going around the world to psychic research conferences and coming and telling him, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, what was going on in that field, Lawrence Rockefeller had him also going to all the UFO conferences and coming back reporting to him how things are going at UFO conferences. Scott's one of the neatest guys I know. He, uh, when I came back from a conference two or three years ago, there was a message that he wanted me to come over to Panama City from Fort Walton Beach and have dinner with him. So I did, and I, uh, I asked him if I could invite a couple of my friends. One was the president of the Philosophical Society over there, and the other is uh, the, the, read, the place called Capstone House, True Seeker Meeting, uh, the guy that headed the UFO committee of that group. and We really had a good time, but he, uh, he had a, a young lady with him who was highly telepathic. And they were there with a National Geographic film crew so that National Geographic could film them in the aquarium with communicating telepathically with the dolphins, which I thought was kind of interesting. Rockefeller paid for him many, many years ago to go into the waters off Bimini to communicate telepathically with the brown-spotted dolphins. I know he gave a report on that at ARE one time. And uh, basically, they were trying to get the dolphins to lead them to previously undiscovered archaeological sites. Voluntary interaction by dolphins with humans is well documented. If you search for it, you'll see a lot of rescue situations. Uh, for thousands of years, you can find reports on that. They, they've been known to provide good therapy for autistic children. We have places in Florida where we have a lot of dolphins that go out into the water and these free Free dolphins come in and interact with the autistic kids, and they, can, they seem to be able to do it better than humans can interact with autistic kids. And dolphins, uh, they perform work. Well, they perform in places like Disney World and elsewhere, but uh, Sea World, but they do work. Also, if you consider uh, underwater demolition stuff for the U.S. Navy as work, There have been a number of reincarnation cases um, concerning these cetaceans. And I don't know how many of you um, saw Lee Shargle's talk up here. Highly controversial. The public really liked, I mean, the audience really liked it, but uh, some of the people found some disinformation in his talk 
and he was highly criticized and discarded. But he showed a, a photo of a, a transparent sphere that had a, a dolphin-like creature kind of standing vertically that interacted with him when he was working on a test project at a, at a secret Navy test base in Northern California, not far from here, actually. And I, I just have an intuitive sense that, that that picture was valid. I've gotten information from other uh, telepathic sources that, that uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the creatures from off planet, intelligent creatures, uh, look more like a dolphin than they do us. So uh, I don't want us to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Just because there was some disinformation in a particular guy's presentation doesn't mean you ought to throw out all that. He said that he had authority from NASA to give some information to us, and he used some really neat Hubble photographs that uh, had not been readily available online like they are now in his presentation. My friend Bob Reed sent me a link from Europe saying that research shows that it's not just humans who have a moral compass. Professor Mark Beekoff believes that morals are hard hardwired into the brains of some mammals to provide social glue, end quote. And I'd like to read to you a paragraph here from from uh, a Reader's Digest book called Intelligence in Animals, published in 1997. A few scientists claim that dolphins really are as intelligent as we are. Most famous among them is John Lilly, the inspiration for the book The Day of the Dolphin. Lilly said, quote, the astronomer Carl Sagan was visiting. One of the dolphins called Elvar swam over to the side of the tank and presented his underside for tickling. Sagan tickled him. Elvar moved away but returned for another bout. Only this time he stopped in the water that was a bit deeper. This happened several times, with Elvar resting in deeper water each time. Eventually, Sagan could not reach any farther without falling in, and he stopped tickling. And Elvar instantly raised himself out of the water, stood on his tail, towering above the two men clearly, and said, more. <laughs> now, had, had the dolphin appreciated the meaning of more, or it had used the word because it gained the right response? Either way, both Sagan and Lily were impressed. Another, another paragraph, dolphin rescues are described as early as 700 BC in Greece. 1989, along the coast of Australia, three boys were surfing among the school of dolphins when a shark, possibly a great white, took a chunk out of the board in one of the boys. Blood streamed into the water. This moment, the dolphins began to splash the water and ram the shark with their snouts, driving the shark away until the boys got to shore. Also off Mozambique, a 20-year-old girl in a boating accident had cut her foot and put blood in the water that attracted sharks. Two dolphins suddenly appeared, chased the sharks away, and helped the girl get to a shipping buoy where she could be rescued by a passing boat. And on page 151, it says that dolphins have the greatest brain-to-body size ratio of any animal, including humans. Bigfoot. I'd like to share with you a piece of an email I got recently. Uh, this is uh, from Jenny. 
I've worked and trained for a great many years in energy psychology and at times with past lives. It is the spirit that is eternal and may sometimes change the species it inhabits. In my own case, I have been three different kinds of reptilians and also yeti. The yeti communicate by telepathy and their cries are an expression of emotion. They are territorial and get upset when humans invade their territory. They are guardians of the earth, as are Aborigines and Native Americans. They are people too, as are the Dauphin people." End quote. Jocko, I think, is my favorite story of Bigfoot. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you read a lot of books on Bigfoot, but I've read every one I could find. In uh, nine, 1897, when Canada was building a cross-Canada railway through Saskatchewan, they had a lot of Chinese coolies at the, at the work camp, and they had cut a, a, a cut through a mountain ridge that had pretty steep sides. There was a path along the top that apparently Bigfoot had used. And as they were coming back into camp on their uh, little work train, they saw this six foot long, 250 pound hairy creature lying beside the tracks and they stopped. It was apparently unconscious. They picked it up, put it on a flatbed, took it into a to town and built a cage before this thing came to. And he was there for six days, six or seven days. They're trying to decide what to do with it. And they decided to take it down to town and have it put in a zoo. Well, the next day, and, and before they could do that, somebody opened the cage and let this guy out. Now, I don't know whether it's because somebody, somebody thought that uh, it just looked too human to be put into a zoo, or Maybe mom or dad came back and got it. <laughs> that's, that's a story I really like, one of the first good stories I read about him. Now, I was asked by the state non-game wildlife biologist to help to assist in them in investigating Bigfoot reports on Eglin Air Force Base, which is, I live three blocks from Eglin Air Force Base, but it's 52 miles wide, 20 miles north and south. That. Uh, about one-third of which is totally off-limits to everybody. They say due to possibility of an unexploded ordnance that might be there. There may be some other reasons. <clears throat> the, um, we found evidence over several years of investigation that there was a, a couple, big male and female, that had left the same tracks there since 1959 in the nearby farm. I started the investigation in October of 87, or maybe December 87, due to reports in October 87. And by 91, there was a third set of tracks that was periodically showing up with the adults. The male track was 17 and a half inches long, eight inches wide. Little, little toe on this side was uh, sticking out like it had been broken. The female track was only 16 inches long. Little toe on the left foot was missing. So they're very distinctive tracks. I got photographs of some really good clear prints. And um, more recently we're getting we're getting uh, reports in the last several years. For four years in a row, we got reports of this six-foot-tall guy, long reddish-brown hair, standing beside US-90, watching the cars go by between, between the Funac Springs and Ponce Leon. And when people would stop, he'd just turn around and walk back into the woods. So um, when we invited Kwani Lapsaritis, the mountain man from Washington, to come to, to uh, speak at Unlimited Horizons, the regional truth-seeking group in Gulf Breeze, I was his host. And he, uh, he called me and he said, 
you know, can I stay a few extra days with you because I want to I wanna go into the, into the woods near where we saw this Bigfoot flam family and see if I can telepathically talk them into coming in to make contact. And I said, sure. You know, I've been on this Iverville woodpecker search in that same habitat in the Chockatch River floodplain, and I'd like to spend a couple of nights there so I might see an ivory bill flying over between its roosting area, nesting area, and, and, the, uh, and the feeding area. So I'll be there with my video camera and trying to get pictures of ivory bills, and you can, you know, call Bigfoot in and see if he'll show. And he's a dowser, and he put a, I sent him a detailed map of the area I wanted to be in, and he put a, he, a dot on the map. He says, this is where Bigfoot is willing to meet us. And we got there. I wanted to be on the other side of the river, because that's where I saw the ivory bill fly over the river. And we got there, and we first looked at that spot, and it was behind a private fence. I mean, behind, it was on private property behind the fence, and I said, no, I'm not going to spend the night there on private property. So we went to my, my plan, which is go across the river, but the whole floodplain, it was eight and a half foot flood stage and there was no dry land on the other side of the river. So we did camp at Morrison Springs inside of a locked gate because the county had just bought it and had a big construction project. And uh, they told us uh, they had to lock the gate when they went out, this eight foot fence around the place. And uh, they'd be back six o'clock in the morning I said, that's okay, we don't mean mine being locked in. We weren't going anywhere. So, so I was sleeping out under the stars, and uh, Kwani was in a tent about 100 feet away. And I was awakened by a pair of great horned owls calling to each other overhead. And I was at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'd been listening, just lying there, enjoying the sounds of the barred owls, three different owls around us calling. And, at 4.30, I heard this very loud descending wail. I know all the sounds of all the animals and birds that live in Florida. And this was not one of those. This is something I had never heard before. And it was coming from the gate to this place in the direction of that dot on the map. It was a, I think it was a lot closer than the dot on the map, maybe uh, several hundred yards or... Um, closer, but it was, I'm convinced that was Bigfoot letting us know he was there. And Kwani independently heard it and said he knew that was Bigfoot. You know, he sensed that that was Bigfoot letting us know he was there. Now maybe the reason he didn't come close, close enough for a sighting is because all the land between us and the gate had been freshly plowed for a new parking lot, and he just didn't want to leave his tracks there. I don't know, or maybe he knew I had a video camera <laughs> that has pretty good low light level capability. But uh, I feel honored that I was allowed to hear a Bigfoot call. Um, Lapsaritis uh, wrote a book called Psychic Sasquatch. And um, there's another fellow named Carl Briam that is a serious Bigfoot researcher, particularly in Oregon. And he, um, he sent me a description of an incident that I think is very important. So let me uh, share a little bit of that. Concerning the mind-boggling mounds that I inspected over a dozen of them, all were of recent construction consisting of sticks and limbs of fairly equal size woven together in a crude fashion. None of these mounds were on trails, and there were no signs of human involvement in their creation. All were above 90, 2,900 feet altitude, and every one of them was built in a northeast direction. The sticks were not gathered in the local locale of the mounds, and the time factor considered for their creation can only be equally astonishing. 
Some were constructed over a fallen log on a, on a rock shelf protruding from a steep slope. One had a living limb the size of a man's leg woven into, the, into it against the limb's direction of growth. The force needed to stretch the large limb backwards and hold it in place to weave it into the 10-foot-tall mound would have to have been very great. I could only surmise that an opposable thumb would have to have been required to complete such a feat. We were very surprised to see the last mound evidently built still under construction, one which would have been the greatest one of all. There were hundreds of sticks, limbs, tossed in all, all around this new mound, and we all looked, and as we looked around the mound, we could see no source of the material. They were aligned, the sticks were aligned in a sturdily built wooden platform, probably 25 feet off the ground. In a direct line of sight, about 70 feet from the platform, was a 55-gallon drum canted outwards with a large, from a large tree, held in place by a great chain which uh, the tree had grown around. The barrel had a crescent moon shape cut in the welded on lid. We discovered very old dried fruit in the bottom of the barrel. There were no creatures in that zone that could reach the fruit through such an opening. We discovered that one could reach into the barrel and while doing so presented a perfect target for a gunman up at, in an apparent shooting stand. The barrel was painted yellow and blue, identical to barrels one would find on a military base. As to the purpose of these mounds, he didn't know, but he, he, he says, I felt the most probable reason was a warning of an ambush site ahead. That shows a lot of intelligence in my mind. I've been forgetting to push the button at the right time. <laughs> this is a copy of the Psychic Sasquatch book. And here's another one I, I read in my research for this. Uh, my brother is a hairy man. Tri Lee Trippett is a Bigfoot researcher, and Ida Cannonberg, some of you may have read her work, she's a, an explorer of consciousness. The two got together to write this book. And Ida Cannonberg says, Lee brought some local maps, and we doused several places where Bigfoot might be found all within the coast range of Oregon. Just about there, a telepathic voice broke into our discussion to give us some specific directions. I have been steadily interacting with such voices since 1977. This was a new one. He introduced himself as Maez, M-A-E-Z, the head of a council that monitors Bigfoot from the planet Arcturus yet. That would explain the UFOs that have been seen in the vicinity of our subject. And 20 pages later, it says, you have asked Ida about bones. Bigfoot is as sentimental about his relative's bones as you are or of your mother's or your cousin's. He would not willingly submit them to desecration by scientific analysis. But in the case that one of their children is born crippled or deformed, or has a defect that shows by the age of two or three years that it will not be, that it will be incapable of growing to care for itself in the wilderness where the family or clan lives, that child is generally, gently smothered and buried as a service to itself as well as to the clan. This does not happen often. But if she could be convinced, the young would be taken care of, taken to a medical facility where it could receive treatment and perhaps be cured or helped and later return to her, the mother might reconsider. 
giving over the child. So that's something that Lee and Ida worked on and to my knowledge have been unsuccessful. It's just been a few years ago they did that. I have a, another short clip here uh, I got from, um, actually it was from a website when I googled Bigfoot speech. And it's about a lady who lived near Briti in British Columbia, near Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> While hunting one afternoon, Victor claimed to have encountered a small, naked, Caucasian boy who he accidentally wounded after firing into an opening in a tree, mistaking him for game. The injured youth rolled out of the opening and began to cry loudly, to which, much to Victor's surprise, responses began to echo back from the nearby woods. Suddenly, a large, hair-covered woman appeared, who scooped up the boy, then turned to Victor with a furious glare and said, you have hurt my child. To Victor's astonishment, the Sasquatch woman spoke these words in what is called the Douglas dialect, said to be 300-year-old variant of the Chehalis language, which is seldom used or even known in modern times. Thought that was an interesting little tidbit. <laughs> I have one more thing I want to cover concerning Bigfoot before we move on to Homo sapiens. This is from uh, an article from Alternative Perceptions Magazine, April 2009, an interview with Kat Hansen, Choctaw medicine woman reveals details of Bigfoot encounters. Kat Hansen, uh, let's see, let me skip on down for time purposes. Uh, they do not choose to know our way of living. For example, they do not cook or read, but they are capable of drawing and like music. They do not play music, but will play with the instruments per se. They do, however, mimic bird whistles and song and have used them many times as a form of entertainment. If I am playing the guitar or a sitar, they will come down and sit quietly in the bushes around the area. When they're done, they will leave the area, and that is all I ever know. They do not tell me if they like it or experience joy or sadness. I do know that they experience anger and rage. They can also forgive. These are emotions that I have firsthand knowledge of, and Kihosa with Kehosa and his kind. Kehosa is her Bigfoot friend. Later it says, for instance, Kehosa can uh, mind speak to people. It is a very unusual gift that took me a long time to get used to. By this I mean he can put pictures into your head and a fleeting voice that is almost like an echo he uses this to communicate and get his meaning across to me. It is also like flashcards strung together to create a meaning. When he does this, though, it causes me terrible pain in the form of migraine headaches. And sometimes nosebleeds. She says sometimes the headaches can last for a couple of days. In this way, they will not have to physically attack us if they did not, if it did not work out. Uh, they would then resort to leading the person away or chasing them away. If that did not work, they would attack. They like their private territory, I think. 
Uh, here's the editor asking her a question. I understand that your first Bigfoot encounter was in Oregon. Kat says, yes. This is where I first met Cahosa. When I was five years old, we were deer hunting, and the adults had left me in a camp by myself. This was a different time back then when children were safe and able to be left alone. I was playing around the camp area with my Barbie dolls that I had brought with me when I heard a crying sound. I listened and kept hearing it. I thought another child was left alone in their camp and was lonely. I looked for the sound and found it a ways into the forest. It came up to a fallen cedar tree. I came up to a fallen cedar tree, and there, sitting on the ground next to it, was a hairy child about as tall as myself. It was crying and rocking back and forth. I just thought it was an ugly child. Maybe it lived in the woods, and that's why it was so dirty. Anyway, when, when I realized that, when it realized when I, I was there, it stopped crying and just stared at me. I sat down across from it and took my Barbie dolls out of my pockets and began to play with them while talking to the child. I was asking it all sorts of questions and finally got up and walked over to me. I offered it a Barbie and it chose the blonde one. And we sat there looking at them and playing with them. A while later, the hairy child stood up and began to whine and kind of bounce up and down and seemed to be really excited about something. As soon as, as I stood up, all of a sudden there was this great big whomp and there landed right in front of me was the biggest, hairiest, ugliest looking thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> it was a male Bigfoot. It was growling this bone jar and growl and grabbing the hairy kid. I kind of screamed and peed my pants and backed away all the same time. He pushed the hairy child back away from me and put himself between us and just looked at me. I started to scream really loud and turned and ran back to the camp. And she said, uh, I told my dad what had happened and he went with me to see the area where you know, the Bigfoot was all he found was tracks. And um, he says, she says, I was very upset because the hairy kid had taken my Barbie doll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Homo alterius. Oh, that's, that's a picture of the mound at Carl Bream, one of the mounds that series of them that led him to the apparently ambush site. Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, let's see. There have been many stories about the origin of our species, but my favorite is in the Urantia book says that Andon and Fanta were genetically upgraded from Homo erectus about 994,000 years ago for the purpose of giving us greater capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness. They were considered the first humans in this, this line of humanity. Three more upgrades occurred in our history. There were six colored races put on the planet, I'm told, in the mountains of northwest India, which was standard procedure, they said, when a planet is right to have this kind of upgrade. You start with the red man, the orange man is next. They call it a secondary species. The yellow man is next. The green man, secondary species. The blue man, I think, named after the eye color rather than skin color, because it says a lot of them went to the northwest, which would be the Scandinavian countries where a lot of blue-eyed people are. You might have heard uh, 
in the, mov in the, uh, the movie, I think it was, 20,000 of those blue-eyed blonde females were taken to the base in the Antarctic as a breeding stock, and 20,000 men, too, as they were developing their anti-gravity technologies and preparing for our soon-to-be graduation, I hope, as a planet. Uh, the gods of old were told to go and breed with the daughters of men. That, that was 200,000 years ago, so you can imagine the stories could be a little distorted when that gets passed by word of mouth down to show up in our Bible about the, you know, the gods of old doing that and the, the Nodites showed up in our Bible too, who were the gods of old that bred with the daughters of men. Adam and Eve were on this planet 35,914 years ago. No, excuse me, 35,915 BC. And they lived about 900 years, long enough to develop a new population of about a million people. And they moved from the first Garden of Eden, which is on a peninsula in the Mediterranean off, off of Syria, after Eve had her problem and had the, had the tree of life taken away from uh, the Garden of Eden. And they went to the area between the Tigris and Euphrates, another place that had been prepared for them in case it was needed. Our scientists now can trace the Adamic genes spreading all over the world from that area between the Tigris and Euphrates. Anybody see the movie Avatar? Not nearly enough. You guys got to go out and see that movie if you haven't. The in 3D, yes. Uh, but it says in the Urantia book that there was a flying creature 37,000 years ago that was big enough for Adam and Eve to get a, an aerial tour of the Garden of Eden when they first got there. They came from the headquarters of our local star system, where they still sit on the Council of 20 and 4 to manage from that level the transformation of this planet. So I think that those flying creatures you see in the movie Avatar, uh, at least they reminded me of these flying creatures that Adam and Eve used. And there are other, there are other uh, stories you're seeing a lot on TV that have flying creatures capable of carrying beings that are fairly intelligent or at least trainable. We, uh, we do have anti-gravity technologies that now allows those of us who are qualified to join the Galactic Society. Graham Thune was a, a friend of mine. He's given a lecture here. He uh, was the pilot that flew Admiral Byrd to Antarctica in 1945. Byrd was sent down there to find out what's going on. He was sent home early. But I think Byrd was able to negotiate U.S. scientists joining the German scientists in that underground base working on advanced technologies. We now, you know, I had a, at this conference, I had a retired um, National Reconnaissance Office officer hand me a photo of what he said was the fifth generation of flying saucers developed by this hidden technology program. I think we now are in the sixth generation of that technology. That's what we used to put our first manned base on Mars in 1963. Some of you are familiar with Alternative 3. I think there's some truth there, probably some disinformation there too. You've got to use your own intuition, your own discernment to decide what's true and what's not. I think British scientists joined that team in 45 also.
Let me talk about uh, Homo alterius spatialis. I was asked by my friend Scott Jones to assist him, him in finding good speakers for the conference that was put on by Lawrence Rockefeller's money under the auspices of the Human Potential Foundation, co-founded by Senator Claiborne Pell and my friend Scott Jones. And uh, Lawrence gave Scott a million dollars. Said first he told him he wanted to set up a 5013C to provide a service for humanity. So he called it Human Potential Foundation. When he got the money in the bank, he said, OK, what do you want me to do? And the guy said, I want you to talk the Clinton administration into releasing to the public previously classified information about the alien presence. Now, I think Scott was very successful in making that happen, but it was all done covertly. I think because of his efforts and Lawrence Rockefeller's efforts, you know, these are Council on Foreign Relations people, uh, we got to see the alien autopsy film. And once they show you an alien that is obviously dead, so you, the general public doesn't have to be too excited. And they were showing all this on the sightings use your free will to turn to that knob, knob to see alien stuff. It's not a violation of the prime directive. Because the third grade students are supposed to do their free will joyous polarization thing without having connections with the larger reality out there. They're kind of, they're kind of restricted to the planet. They're under quarantine, actually. So, uh, Scott Jones invited Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Carl Sagan, a bunch of UN people to that conference. They all turned him down. They sent their lawyer, George S. Robinson. And uh, I found him very interesting. The title of his book, or his presentation, was Homo Alterio Spatialis, E.T. Progeny of Humankind and the Declar a Declaration of Interdependence. Very interesting title, but what the man said was we humans cannot take any national law into space. We have to figure out what the cosmic or natural laws are, what laws pertain to us out there, the aliens down here, and to human-alien hybrids here, there, and everywhere. I thought that was an important message. There were only 250 people in the audience. Although the proceedings of that conference were published, and you can still get them at Headline Books, Dot com. Just go to that website and, uh, and click on Proceedings, and I think there's some still available. Good reading. Every word spoken at that conference, even at, at the panels. I, I, was, I had uh, Leo Sprinkle and Ruth Montgomery and uh, Richard Boylan on, on the panel on Hope. And the whole Q&A sessions of all of that is there. The invitation letters to all these VIPs are there. Their responses are all in that proceedings of that conference. It's available to seek it, and you'll find it. When, he, when that paper was published as the leading article in the proceedings, he changed the subtitle to, well, the title was Homo Alteria Spatialis, A Transgenic Odyssey. Well, anyway, I invited him to come here to speak at one of our conferences, and he accepted. I asked Scott to give me a little help on that issue. And he came and he gave a talk called Astro Law and Space Law and Astro Law. What he said to, an, to our audience was, we humans have already made a new subspecies Homo sapiens alterios, and a new species, Homo alterios spatialis, and we did it to make us more survivable on off-planet conditions. That's a profound statement. He was not allowed to mention aliens. He told me, I was his host when he showed up here, he told me that uh, he spent six hours putting into his computer what he would say. And when he stood at this podium, he started out and said, sorry, folks, I'm going to have to read this. He re we told him we wanted 15 minutes Q&A. 
he said, okay. So he read for an hour and a quarter, took questions 15 minutes, and left. The only time, I've introduced a number of speakers here, the only time that anybody has ever told me before they took this podium. I'm in the, in the midst of a, of a law case involving the White House. And if I get a phone call while I'm on the podium, you can just have to come up and give me a few minutes to talk on the phone, and I'll come back and finish it. But uh, interesting fellow with an interesting law practice. Let me uh, show you some books that you can find on Amazon.com if you are right into their search engine, George S. Robinson. I think these are really interesting books. He's, I asked him, how many, how many books has he written? He says, more than I can remember the titles of when I introduced him. But Living in Outer Space, published in 1976, I thought was interesting. Envoys of Mankind is the one I wrote. Or I read, uh, that was 88, I think. Um, Declaration of First Principles for the Governing of Space Societies. Space Trek, An Endless Migration. That was 1988. Astro Law, Carrying Human Rights into Outer Space. 28 July, 05. Hopefully soon I will find the time to read that one. You know you got to be somebody special to get your face on the cover of Time magazine. Council on Foreign Relations control, you know, is, controls the board of Time magazine, and I think they probably caused this picture to be there so that we would better be able to accept our hybrid children. You remember uh, Gene Roddenberry's Earth, The Final Conflict, the last series of the Star Trek series? There's a guy named Duan, and he looks very much like this. I think that appearance was also meant to be educational for us help these societies merge, not just below ground like they are now and on our bases in Moon and Mars, but on the surface when the time is right. And the time is right when everybody on this planet is willing to accept these guys as their neighbors, partners, whatever. The species here is not named, but I'm convinced that this is what it is, Homo alterio spatialis. There's six pages of information in that book that are designed for the audience of Time magazine. You know, not very exciting to us. Debbie Tomey, who is uh, Kathy Davis in Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, made this drawing of her hybrid daughter. CBS made a mini-series of her story. She was taken on board twice to be introduced to her hybrid kids. And I'm convinced that this is the same species you saw on the cover of Time. The Time cover guy was wearing uh, contact sunglasses. This one didn't. They got blue eyes. Debbie tells me all of them she's seen have blue eyes. The lady that I think has had more experience on board flying saucers than anybody I know is Kay Wilson. And her website is called The Alien Jigsaw. And she has a paper there called uh, True Experiences of Alien Reduction. We are the hybrids, we are coming. Let me share a little bit of this with you. We know that alien-human hybrids have been created, and with each new generation, they're becoming more human. 
If some of them intend to inhabit our planet, their survival will depend on blending with, in, with us, learning how to dress like us, wearing the appropriate clothing and hairstyles, being able to take care of and feed themselves in a human-dominated environment. Common everyday things we take for granted because we have been taught them since childhood or something they have to learn. Imagine being a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old and not knowing what a loaf of bread is, much less how to purchase it and what to do with it. It is possible that we are often seeing different stages of hybrid beings among the artificial evolutionary ladder, which were not created through evolution at all. The blondes, for example, may be a much older advanced alien hybrid offshoot than the more gray-appearing hybrids. But because the gray hybrids are much younger than the blondes or Nordics, they are sometimes called, uh, they retain more of their alien-appearing characteristics. We know there are many different types of aliens interacting with and abducting human beings. What we are not completely certain of, however, is if all are working together. My personal experiences have shown me that the greys, the short pudgy beings, the reptilian appearing beings, and to a lesser extent the blondes, are all interacting or interested in our physiology and they are taking specific types of DNA from us for specific reasons. Let me talk a little about the Dagon people. Uh, I really thank Sandra for giving me that book, The Sea Gods After Atlantis, Biography of a Race of Man, because, because of that, I have uh, become friends with the only uh, living author, Valerie Bonwick, Vancouver. And uh, I've read the other two books that they produced, Teachings of the Sea Gods, Training of an Adept, The Ladder Path. And that self-help book makes more sense to me than, uh, than all the other different processes for raising our consciousness that you find taught by many people in this room. I mean, it's very similar, but it's concise and well-written, and I recommend it's worthwhile reading. The only way you can get that book is by copying down this phone number or address $20 each, at least in the U.S. and Canada, includes postage and handling for each of the books. I would like to share now a few statements from that book, See Gods After Atlantis. Page 25 says, After the Deluge. The main reason that we make contact with you now is to help you who still live on the land, to fill in one of the gaps of your prehistory. Of all the cultures that owe either their racial heritage or their cultural impetus to Atlantis, ours is the only one that retains an unbroken account from before the fall of, the Atlant of Atlantis. Und under the title, The Dagon, the Hybrids, and the Myrrh. Down through the centuries, our people have often been confused with the race of myrrh because of our habitat, even though there are records of our forebears' intermarriage with land dwellers of the coastal regions in isolated incidences. I believe there are still Scottish families whose verbal records bear this out. There are accounts of such in the traditional stories of Wales also. However, we are quite different in physique and physiology from the members of the Myrrh evolution. The Myrrh were 
or belong to a family of hybrids whose ancestors were developed as a result of some very early crossbreeding by those same scientists who adapted our own species. But their scientists did since they were building cities under, under our oceans. They now have 12 big dome cities. Is they put gills in their neck so that they could stay longer underwater without coming up for a breath. This was also an effort to ensure the continuance of intelligent life on this planet by developing new species which were physically equipped to survive in a vastly changed environment. But with the passage of time, the myrrh have drawn closer to the sea mammals and further away from man. I think that, I think that means that these mermaids and mermen like, like the dolphins a lot better than they like us. Probably good reason there. <laughs> under the title Founding of Underwater Communities. After seemingly endless years of struggle just to survive, their small settlements became established well enough for in the caves to begin thinking about the process of building underwater dwelling units, capable of housing a community complete with the improvements in living conditions which they consider to be essential to the well-being of its citizens, all under one roof. For all these many years, since our people have continued to upgrade the dome cities. Uh, but to begin with, the basic problems to be solved for any of our communities were the same. One, to supply sufficient drinking water by, by the conversion of seawater with which they were surrounded. Two, to cope with the problem of sewage and avoid polluting their surroundings by designing and constructing efficient sanitation units. We need to work on that, by the way. Three, the need to develop a constant and reliable food supply, and four, to ensure that all life support systems solve the problems arising from pollution and did not add to them. Once our people had established their towns, both their artistic and intellectual drive took the direction toward creating an underwater copy of whatever had formerly represented the best on land. From their point of view at that time, However, if you were to visit the oldest of our dome cities first, and then visit those that were built more recently in the order of their planning, you would notice the results of a gradual but, uh, but remarkable change in our forebearers' psychological makeup that not only revolutionized design and taste, but more pertinently also inspired a radical spiritual change. And under our common goals, it says the overall goal of our people is that of harmony. But it is that harmony that results from creative intelligence, responsibly applied, and then vibrated with vitality. All our effort is conscious and is consciously applied. We, the Dagon, would like to help humankind if or when the time should come you need the help of those who have walked the path before you. And lastly here, the judicial system of the Dagon. The lawgiver fully fulfilled the unwelcome responsibility of being judge, jury, and executioner of the penalty. And the, the lawgiver has an appointed telepath to work with him. The empath is one who is especially chosen as a seer who also poses an outstanding ability to function on the higher planes to register the emotional impact upon the offender standing before the law and to determine how severe the penalty should be after examining the offender's records of past lives. It should be added that one of the most important tasks that falls to the empath is to ensure that no penalty is so severe as to leave a permanent scar upon the personality of the offender, other than that which the own, their own guilt may determine. Therefore, the empath ensures a delicate precision to a fair and just verdict. I wonder how long it's going to take to get our courts to include an empath. Maybe some of you might want to apply for that job.
You know, they say they made the mer people, and um, when I read uh, Hanley, um, um, Manley P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, you'll see three pages in there on Oannes. Oannes is a fish-like creature that had both a tail and feet. And about 5,000 years ago, in the Middle East here, he would every day walk up out of the sea and teach those people all, all kinds of profound things and every night walk back into the sea, referred to as a sea god. Here's the cover of that book that Valerie Hall and her husband Jonathan wrote. Sorry I didn't have this up when I was talking about it. Now let me get into the last of these six species. Don't have a whole lot of time left, but um, <clears throat> the reptiloids of inner earth is um, what Lacerda called them. And this lady was interviewed by a guy who uses the name Ole K. He, he doesn't want people to know who he really is because he, he thinks there may be government resistance to this information getting out to the world. So um, his first interview is 16 December. And the second one was uh, 24 April 2000 in a secret location. The third is 28-year-old female reptiloid living in an underground system on Earth. She said her people have lived here longer than humans and are descended from dinosaurs. More advanced technologically, and some of the flying saucers we see are theirs. And, uh, I copied both uh, that first interview, which is condensed into 24 pages, now, now available in six languages. Second interview has been condensed by Ole K into 20 pages. You can Google Lacerta or whatever, or go to Saban.org, unless they've taken it down off that site. But let me share a little bit of what uh, Lacerta told us about these other, these most senior eternal spiritual beings that inhabit this planet and call it home. Holy K starts out with an introduction that says, uh, parts of a transcript of an interview I made with a non-human and reptilian being, December 99. This female being was already in contact with a friend of mine uh, only listed as EF for several months before this interview is taken. It says, I will send this shortened version uh, to a number of good friends of his for translation into the other five languages uh, in Finland, Norway, Germany, France. Paranormal abilities of her species, like telepathy and telekinesis, like flying an apple around 40 centimeters above her hands, were shown to me during the three hours and six minutes of the meeting. And I'm absolutely sure that these abilities were no tricks. The following is certainly difficult to understand and to believe for someone who hasn't experienced it, but I was really in contact with her mind and I'm now completely sure that everything said during the interview is the absolute truth about our world. Question, who and what are you? As you could see with your own eyes, I am not a human being like you, and to be honest, I am not a real mammal, despite my apparently mammal-like body features which were a result of evolution. I'm a female reptile being belonging to a very old reptilian race. We are the native Terrans, and we live on that planet 
on this planet since millions of years. We are mentioned in your religious writings, like your Christian Bible, and many of the ancient human tribes were aware of our presence and worshipped us as gods. Egyptians and the Inca, for example. Your Christian religion has misunderstood our role in your creation. So we are mentioned as evil serpent in your writings. This is wrong. Your race was genetically engineered by aliens, and we were just the more or less passive visitors of this accelerated evolutionary process. Question, your name. Please call me Lacerta. This is the name I generally use when I'm not among humans, or when I am among humans and talk with them. Question, how old are you? We measure the time not like you in astronomical years. And in the revolve of the Earth around the sun, because we usually live beneath the surface of the planet. Our time measurement depends on periodically returning cycles in the Earth's magnetic field. And according to this, and said with your numbers, today, let me calculate, 57,653 cycles old. I have reached my adult phase and my awareness 16,337 cycles ago. This is a very important date for us. According to your human time scale, I'm around 28 years old. Question, you have a job like us. To say it with your words, I'm a curious student of the social behavior of your species. That's why I'm here and talk to you. That's why I have revealed my nature to EF and now to you, and that's why I give you all the secret information and why I will try to answer all the questions on your many sheets of paper. Honestly, I will see how you react, how others in your, of your kind react. I'm quite sure every one of you will refuse to believe my words, but I hope I'm wrong because you need to understand if you want to survive the coming years. Question, are UFOs real flying objects piloted by extraterrestrials or do they belong to your species? Some observed UFOs, as you call them, belong to us but most not. If you read a report about the sighting of a metalish, bright gray, cigar-shaped cylindrical object with a length of between 20 and 260 of your meters, and if this object had made a very deep humming sound, and if there were five bright red lights on the metalish surface of the cigar, then it's likely that some one of you has seen one of our ships, and this means that it was either partly defect or that some one of us was not careful enough. We have also a very small fleet of disc-shaped craft. Such UFOs belong usually to an alien species. Triangular UFOs belong generally to your own military, but they use foreign technology to build them. If you really want to try to see one of our craft, you should have to look at the skies over the Arctic, the Antarctic, or over Inner Asia, especially over the mountains there. Question, have you a special symbol with which we can identify your kind? We have two major symbols representing our species. One is a blue serpent with four white wings on a black background. The symbol uh, used from uh, certain parts of my society, but it is today very seldom. You humans have copied it very often in your old writings. The other symbol is a mystic being you would call a dragon in the shape of a circle with seven white stars in the middle. 
If you see one of that symbol on a cylindrical craft I've described in my previous answer, or on some underground installation, this thing or place belongs definitely to us. And I would advise you to go, <laughs> to go away from there as soon as possible. Uh, he, he questions the seven stars, and, and uh, the answer, Pleiades, no. Actually, the seven stars are planets and moons, and they are a symbol for our former seven colonies in the solar system. The stars are shown in the front of a blue background. Uh, with the dragon circle, means the shape of the Earth. The seven white stars mean moons, Mars, Venus, our moon, Mars, Venus, and four moons of Jupiter and Saturn. We had colonized in the past. Two colonies are no longer in use and abandoned, so five stars would be more correct. Question. As you have not allowed me to make photos, can you describe yourself in detail? And I'll skip a paragraph or two. Like you, I have a head, two arms, two hands, two legs, and two feet, and the properties of my body are like yours. As I'm female, I have also two breasts. Despite our reptile origin, we have started to give milk to our children during the evolutionary process. This happens around, happened around 30 million years ago because this is the best thing to keep the young alive. That means that we are now real mammals, but the breasts of us are not as large as those of human women, and the size of them is generally equal in every female of my kind. The eternal reproduction organs are far, for both sexes, similar to those of humans, but they are visible and they they are visible and they have the same function as yours. Question, what kind of clothing do you generally wear? I wear this human everyday clothing only when I'm among humans. To be honest, it's not very comfortable for me to wear such th tight things as it al is always a very unusual feeling. If we are in our own home, this means in our subterranean home, or in our large artificial sun areas, and if we are together with others near our own home, we are usually naked. If this, is this shocking to you? When we are in the public and together with many others of my species, we wear very wide and soft clothing made of thin, light stuff. I have told you that many parts of our bodies are very touch sensitive, mostly the small back plates, so we can't feel comfortable in tight clothing because it can hurt us. Men and women wear often the same kind of clothing, but the colors are different for the sexes. Have you a tail like normal reptiles? No, we have no tail. Question, do you, have, do you lay eggs? Yes, but not like your birds or primitive reptiles. Actually, the embryo grows in a protein liquid inside the mother's womb, but there is also an egg-shaped but very thin chalk hull around it that fills the whole womb. The embryo inside this hull is completely autark. I think it says, from the mother's body, and it has every substance it needs to develop inside the chalk hull. There is no cord like your navel cord, which is connected to a point hidden behind the, the back plates. There is also a cord, excuse me, like your navel connected to the area behind the back plates. When the baby is going to the, be born, the whole egg is passed through the vagina, covered in a slimy protein substance, and the baby came out of this soft egg after some minutes. 
these two horns on our middle fingers were ins instinctively used from babies to break through the chalk hole to take their first breath. Our young are not so large as your babies when they are born. They are between 30 and 35 of your centimeters tall. The egg is around 40 centimeters tall. This is because our vagina is smaller and the, than the human one. But we grow to a normal size of 1.6 to 1.8 meters. Question, what do you eat? Flesh, fruit, vegetables, special kinds of fungus, and other things. We can also eat and digest some substances which are poisonous for you. The main difference between you and us is that we must eat flesh because our body needs the proteins. We can't live completely vegetarian like your kind because our digestion would stop working and we would die after some weeks or maybe months without flesh. Many of us eat raw flesh or other things that would be disgusting to you. Perhaps I prefer, perhaps, personally I prefer cooked flesh and surface fruits like apples and oranges. Question. <clears throat> you speak sometimes about underground cities and artificial sunlight. Do you mean something like the hollow earth? No. Earth is not really completely hollow and there is no second sun inside. The story is ridiculous and physically not possible. Even your species should be intelligent enough not to believe this. Do you know how much mass... Well, let me skip that and go on down. When I talk about our subterranean home, I talk about large cave systems. The caves you have discovered near the surface are tiny in comparison to real caves and huge caverns deeper in the earth in a depth of 2,000 to 8,000 of your meters, but connected with many hidden tunnels in the surface, to the surface, or to surface near caverns. And we live in large and advanced cities and colonies inside such caves. Major cities of us are beyond the Arctic, the Antarctic, Inner Asia, North America, and Australia. If I talk about artificial sunlight in our cities, I don't mean real sun, but various technological sources of light, including gravitational sources, which illuminates the caverns and tunnels. There are special cave areas and tunnels with a strong UV light in every city, and we use that to heat our blood. Furthermore, we have also some surface sun places in remote areas, especially in America and Australia. Question, where do we find such surface near entry to your worlds? Do you really think I will tell you their exact location? If you want to find such an entry, you have to search it by yourselves, but I would advise you not to do that. When I came to the surface four days ago, I used an entry approximately 300 of your kilometers north from here, near here, to a large lake, but I doubt that you would be able to find it. Talking about their the energy of their mind, he asks, can you kill with that? And um, the answer is yes, but it's forbidden. Question. Uh, you said you can hide your UFOs. How do you do that? Uh, Yes, but on a, a, a um, I don't know, I can't read that, excuse me. There is a powerful device inside each craft which is able to send an artificial signal to your minds to convince you that what you, you see either nothing or only in the sky that which you nor see as a normal aircraft.
If you were able to see our UFOs, it means that the device is either defective or deactivated for some reason. Most of the surface near entry points to our tunnels are also hidden with such device. And you, you will uh, generally see only normal cave walls instead of the doors. Question, back to your uh, and our own history. You've mentioned the race of the Elohim who have created our human race. The Elohim came from this universe, from the star system you call Aldebaran. They were very tall humanoid species, which usually, with usually blonde hairs and very white skin. Now, does this mean that uh, those who first taught humans anti-gravity technologies back in 1929 were what the Bible calls the Elohim. Interesting connection there. Last question. How can we protect us against this influence on our mind? And she says, I don't know. I doubt you can because your mind is like an open book to read and write for nearly every species I know. Oh, one more question, excuse me. Do you want to say a last sentence or message? And she says, open your eyes and see. Don't believe only in your wrong history or your scientists or your politicians. Some of them know the truth about various things, but they don't inform the public to avoid confusion and panic. So, here are my conclusions. <clears throat> Intelligent life is abundant throughout the universe. Telepathy is the primary means of communication. Others read our thoughts, so watch what you think. We learn to express unconditional love in a fourth grade classroom for the soul. And all of our classmates will not look like us. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Whoops. She said, don't go to a Q&A session if you if you only have five minutes. But uh, we have five minutes, so come on, I'll take maybe two questions, three questions, if anybody wants questions. If you can manage that. All right, let's skip it. Nick, you, or our producer, will be happy if I skip it. <laughs> Thank you. Time to go to lunch.